back students. We're going to continue our discussion of climate change and in this video lecture we're going to talk about some historical measurements of both the levels of carbon dioxide and temperature. But first let's talk about the carbon cycle or various processes that can either produce carbon dioxide or consume carbon dioxide. Let's begin with the very important one, photosynthesis, probably the most important process that occurs on planet Earth. In photosynthesis, photosynthesis actually consumes carbon dioxide. We have carbon dioxide plus water plus energy from the sun forming a carbohydrate, a hydrate of carbon, such as glucose or cellulose, and oxygen, the oxygen that we breathe. In fact, it's the oxygen that is produced in photosynthesis that supports all of aerobic life, including us. In fact, I oftentimes point out that in the movie E.T., everyone has seen E.T. at the very beginning of the movie, what is happening? E.T.'s parents, or a group of scientists, have landed on planet Earth. They see this, all these lights in the city down in the valley, but what they're interested in studying is the plant life in the nearby forest. Remember, they are taking plant samples because they realized that photosynthesis is such an important process and they wanted to see if this little blue-green planet that they discovered had photosynthesis in the same way that they were accustomed to. No doubt that was the reason they visited us. So photosynthesis consumes carbon dioxide. The second important process is respiration in which a carbohydrate, a hydrate of carbon again, Glucose, for example, reacts with oxygen to reform carbon dioxide and water and to produce energy, such as ATP. This is a type of reaction that occurs in our bodies after we consume a cheeseburger, after we have lunch, we will metabolize the fuel molecules, such as carbohydrates, to produce carbon dioxide, which we exhale, and water vapor and to produce the energy that we need to carry out various functions in our bodies. Now you'll notice that photosynthesis and respiration are in essence the reverse of one another. Photosynthesis consumes carbon dioxide to produce a hydrate of carbon or a carbohydrate and in respiration the carbohydrate is oxidized back to carbon dioxide and water vapor. But there are other important reactions that either produce or consume carbon dioxide. One of these is the combustion of coal or petroleum products that is reacting coal or petroleum with oxygen to form carbon dioxide. This type of reaction, the combustion or the oxidation of carbon or fossil fuels to produce carbon dioxide is how we produce energy that we need for so many processes in our daily lives. In reaction four, we see that carbon dioxide can also dissolve in water, the water in the oceans, to produce carbonic acid, which then can dissociate in hydrogen carbonate and hydrogen ions. But what is important here is that carbon dioxide in the atmosphere can be dissolved in the oceans. Also, carbon dioxide can be released from volcanic eruptions. Quite a bit of carbon dioxide gas seems to be trapped under the crust of the earth and can be released upon these eruptions. And the last reaction shown here is that hydrogen carbonate can react with calcium ions to form calcium carbonate, which is chalk or lime. This calcium carbonate we find in our bones and our skeletons and in the shells of sea creatures, mollusks and clams, for example. So this slide just shows you a number of important reactions that either produce carbon dioxide or consume carbon dioxide on planet Earth. I said this video lecture will be about historical measurements of carbon dioxide. We talked about Dr. Charles Keeling in our first video lecture and how he decided to begin measuring the atmospheric levels of carbon dioxide on a very systematic basis. Well, how do we get data on carbon dioxide levels prior to 1958? Well, a way that this has been done is to go to like the Antarctic and drill holes in the ice, very deep holes, as much as two to 3,000 meters deep, that's a couple of miles deep into the ice. And when you do this and pull out the ice, you see some striations that are much like the rings on a tree. 
and there can be very small pockets of air or bubbles frozen within this ice, and scientists can analyze this frozen fossil air to determine the carbon dioxide levels relative to the other gases. And when they have done that, they see a pattern such as the following. These are data from one of these ice cores drilled about two or 3,000 meters deep into the Antarctic. And you can see that the carbon dioxide concentration in parts per million has varied from about 180 parts per million up to about 280 parts per million over the last 800 thousand years, 800,000 years, that's the x-axis. And you can see that it's kind of oscillated in a very slow pattern up and down. It's actually a fairly jagged pattern. And if you remember where our story began with Dr. Charles Keeling, he measured carbon dioxide levels of about 310 parts per million. But he has found since his first measurements in 1958 that the carbon dioxide level has gone up dramatically. And in fact, in this slide, I show a very, very recent measurement, uh, 404 parts per million. So again, this value has gone from about 300 to 404, and that is the very dramatic upward spike that you see in the right part of this graph, that is the current data. So from these ice core measurements, scientists have been able to determine the carbon dioxide level in the atmosphere over this very long period of time back 800,000 years in the past. And what is important to note is that current carbon dioxide levels are shooting up and are much higher than any values on the past, at least for this last 800,000 years on planet Earth. But then the question is, okay, well, how does this compare or can we correlate or compare this to the average temperature on planet Earth? And it turns out that from the same type of ice core measurements, there's another technique by measuring the ratio of isotopes of oxygen in the water. I won't go into this, but there are different isotopes of oxygen, O18 and O16. And from the ratio of these two isotopes, one can determine the average temperature. And so, this slide shows a compressed part of the previous slide, only going back to 450,000 years, only about half as long as the previous one. But for this period of time, scientists can also get an estimate of the temperature. So what is shown in the blue graph, which corresponds to the left temperature axis, is the difference in temperature from the current temperature. That is, it's a difference in temperature. Remember that the current average global temperature is about 14 degrees Celsius, which corresponds to about 57 degrees Fahrenheit. So that what you see is that starting around 430 or so thousand years ago, the temperature was actually slightly warmer than the current temperature, but then it dropped, dropped to as much as eight degrees below the current temperature eight degrees centigrade below the current temperature. That is what we would call an ice age. Then there was a dramatic warming event, reaching a average global temperature of maybe two to three degrees above the current temperature. That was followed then by another cooling phase, another ice age, another dramatic warming, and then another ice age, another warming phase at around 130,000 years ago, and then a cooling phase or another ice age. And then there was a warming reaching a plateau for the last 10 to 15,000 years where the temperature has been fairly stable at 14 degrees centigrade. Now, what you might notice is the correlation between the carbon dioxide levels and the average global temperature. Where there are peaks in the carbon dioxide level, there are peaks in the temperature. Where there are valleys in the carbon dioxide level, valleys are low temperature regions. And this is what is of concern to scientists. That is, when the carbon dioxide levels go up, will the temperature go up? And you can see for the carbon dioxide level, it is spiking up in the last 50 years or so. 
And the question is, of course, is will there be or how much of a temperature increase will follow this increase in carbon dioxide level? And of course, of greater concern is that planet Earth has never seen or experienced carbon dioxide levels as high as we have now. Now on this graph, I have some arrows sort of pointing out some, uh, some references in time where of course over to the right, we have the now period. And then I've tried to draw an arrow for zero AD or 2000 years ago, because we usually think about the recorded history of mankind in terms of the birth of Christ. And then maybe a few thousand years before that is recorded history of modern humans. We will discuss in other chapters that modern humans actually came into existence about 200,000 years ago. And our predecessors, other humanoids, came into existence maybe 500,000, maybe as long, far back as 2 million years ago. The point is that modern humans have lived through a couple of ice ages between the one between 150 to 200,000 years ago and the ice age from about uh, 25,000 years ago to 100,000 years ago. So modern humans, Homo sapiens, have lived through a couple of ice ages in which the temperature span has been as much as 10 degrees. If you remember that y-axis where we've temp where the temperature has dropped, but sometimes it's gone above the current average, but then it has dropped. The temperature span has been as much as 10 degrees, which is about 18 degrees Fahrenheit. But these changes in temperature have occurred over periods of 100,000 years or more. And remember, for reference, the recorded history of mankind may be only about 5,000 years. So while man, Homo sapiens, may have endured some of these changes in climate, that hasn't been modern humans. That hasn't been the recent history of mankind. And that those Homo sapiens and other life forms that have lived through these cycles of ice ages and warming have no doubt adapted and migrated, and there have been extinctions and speciation that have occurred along with these climate changes. Now, in addition to direct correlation between the global temperature and atmospheric carbon dioxide levels, there's also evidence that there may be cooling events that are triggered by such things as dust particles, volcanic eruptions, that can block the transmission of sunlight and can lower temperature. And in addition to these major ice age periods, which have a cycle of approximately 100,000 years, there also can be minor ice age periods that occur with a frequency of maybe every thousand years or so. Uh, in fact, the last minor ice age, called the Little Ice Age, occurred between about 1550 and 1850 AD during which time the Thames River in England, that's the river that flows through London, uh, froze and the Baltic Sea, that's the, the sea between Denmark and, and Sweden and, and Finland, uh, froze and other rivers in Europe were completely frozen over the winter. And history shows that there were famines in Europe during this period of time. Okay, we're going to pause, take a little quiz, and in the next video lesson, we'll talk about the greenhouse effect. See you in a while.